peer review is hailed as the bastion of science, the great filter through which all research must go, where every author is judged and scrutinized by their peers before they're deemed suitable for publication. Every journal has their own approach to it, but whether it's open review, double-blind review, or post-publication review, this is the core concept. Science is upheld by the scrutiny of one's peers. Now, the history of peer review is one long meandering branch, too long for us to discuss here. Over time, its meaning and extent has changed from millennium-old precursors to the modern idea that we take for granted today, which only developed and took shape after World War II. Discussions on its various foibles are also not new. By now, countless researchers have discussed every aspect of peer review, and even when it's found wanting, proponents will return to the idea, the common trope, of its relationship with democracy, that it is full of problems, but the least worst system that we have available to us. Even so, the existence of Retraction Watch, for example, is testament to science's uncomfortable relationship with ethics and the challenges of maintaining ethical standards within scientific publication. This is a constantly ongoing struggle and even the idealist cannot say that peer review alone will guarantee quality. Ironically, at the heart of peer review is trust. We trust that the people undertaking it are competent and impartial, but therein lies its principal flaw. It is a fundamentally human endeavor. In this video, I'm going to go over a few practical issues in peer review, the real-world, lived experience of needing to deal with these foibles every day. Before we begin, let's get some caveats out of the way. One, your mileage might vary. Some people have only positive experiences with peer review. Others have only negative experiences. I will be presenting my own lived experience, both good and bad, from working with both authors and journals. There might be other examples. This is not an exhaustive list. Two, I am not an academic or a philosopher of science. If you need someone to have a series of letters after their name for their opinion to matter, you are SOL. My evidence base is working with authors, submitting to journals and responding to reviewers, and also working with journals on their editorial process, and sometimes having to take a direct hand in that editorial process. Let's look at the author experience first. One, some reviewers are bad. Any experienced researcher might be familiar with the infamous reviewer number two. This dastardly coward goes about reviewing papers of a myriad subjects, none of which he has any experience or knowledge about, misreading what the authors write, coming to his own conclusions independent of the results of the authors, and then slamming them for failing to come to the direct correct conclusion that is not based on anything factual within the paper. He is truly the worst, the most wicked of all academic devils. Well, the fact is that reviewer number two does exist. We cannot always avoid such a reviewer. Some people are just plain bad at the task of reviewing a paper. Not everyone is equipped for it. And unfortunately, we don't know when we will encounter reviewer number two until we are on the receiving end of their incompetence. If we're lucky, we get to submit our paper to a journal that is excellent at picking reviewers, but how many journals is that really? We'll find out. Reviewer number two is a wild card. We don't know when they're going to show up and ruin our day. Speaking of which, peer review is again a fundamentally human endeavor. And every now and then, everyone has a bad day. Maybe they woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Maybe they're suffering from some annoyance at the office. Or maybe they're just going through a bad breakup and are not feeling well. They might be upset about something. They might have a sore stomach. But what the result of that is, is maybe 
putting less attention to something than they might otherwise have. In spite of the rigors that we'd hope for in peer review, we just cannot discount the fact that someone might be having a bad day on the day that they're reviewing our own paper. And this simple fact can actually undermine the entire idea of peer review. And where we're concerned as authors, it will basically undermine our entire submission. While the toads are croaking, we will look at the journal side. The biggest thing that people need to know about journals is that they are not all built equally. When we apply the idea of peer review, we tend to be thinking about larger journals, not lowly, small journals. We're thinking of nature. And for better or worse, big journals are able to take from the biggest pool from the most competent and eminent reviewers and the smaller that the journal gets the smaller that the pool gets and the less likely they are to have the most rigorous and thorough review obviously the vast vast majority of journals are not nature or science and it's even likely that you've not heard of most of the journals publishing within your own field this really does show the inherent disadvantage that many journals face by default. The majority of them wind up having fewer resources than their larger competitors, and some in fact have barely any resources at all. You would be surprised to know how many journals are just barely scraping by from issue to issue, reviewer to reviewer. At the same time, there's no logical reason to assume that a smaller journal might have the same editorial quality as a larger one. They absolutely can, but in my experience, journals just don't have the robustness that we might expect of them, even the larger ones. This robustness can apply to the entire editorial process from submission to handling reviewers, revisions, and then potentially publication. But for the purposes of our discussion, it applies simply to the simple task of picking a reviewer and then reading that review and deciding if the reviewers come to the correct conclusions in the right way. The sad case for authors is that they're reliant on journals picking the correct and appropriate reviewers for their work. And even when they're asked to pick a reviewer themselves, that's still not always the case. This might be the price of doing business in science, but for authors, the price ends up being rejection, wasted effort and potentially a blow to one's mental health. Some journals are just straight up unethical. Predatory journals is a loaded term nowadays and the discussion of it is really mired in controversy. Not all so-called predatory journals are actually predatory, they might just be ethically questionable or lack the resources yet to be 100% ethical. Because predatory publication is profit-driven, we can guess that they have little interest in good thorough reviews that elongate the time between submission and publication. It is possible for a publisher to be both profit-driven and ethical, maybe. But when we see a paper that's been accepted for publication, say, a week after its submission, we might want to bring up questions about its peer review process. Outside of journals that focus on quantity over quality, there also exists a subset of journals that might employ unethical practices. These practices can vary from, for example, uh, editor telling the reviewer to be lenient on a particular paper or maybe harsh for some reason. The reviewer might actually be an editor pretending to be a reviewer because they cannot find someone for a particular paper. Or they might be claiming that they're using a double-blind peer review process but accidentally revealing the identity of the authors within the review copy. They might not be intentionally unethical, but through their maybe negligence, the editorial process is called into question, the peer review is called into question, 
and then maybe the integrity of the journal is also called into question. A further subset of journals isn't inexperienced or incompetent. They're on purpose unethical. I'm going to avoid gossip here and naming names, but both the Directory of Open Access Journals and Scopus catalog the journals that they remove from their respective index. In the case of DOAJ, they can include something basic like a broken URL or inactivity, not necessarily unethical practice, but they might also cite, for example, suspected editorial misconduct. In the case of Scopus, they will say publication concerns. These are vague references, and I need to be clear that no indexing service is the ultimate arbiter of quality, but nevertheless, these lists are useful for us to know more about the journal that we might intend to submit our paper to. Think, publish or perish and dumb university metrics for this. Science analytics companies peddle tools that promote the quantification of researchers' output and institutions pay a lot of money to gobble up these tools so that they can put a number on your livelihood as a lecturer or a researcher. Lecturers need to publish consistently irrespective of whether they actually have something worth publishing and this is the more problematic part there are universities that require students to publish a paper as part of their degree this fact viewed broadly isn't because universities have an interest in developing students writing skills they might but in many cases they're just actually secretly competing with each other to be the X institution with the Y most something the most students who are publishing a paper, the most papers in total, the most anything that will garner some sweet, easy, quantifiable praise and potentially other things. It's great for me as the hypothetical student that I get to publish a paper. There are two effects from this trend. In my experience and the experience of many journals, most students just don't produce very good work and this is actually for a good reason. Students are making mistakes as they go. They're still learning as they're studying and writing and publishing and so we cannot really expect them to publish something that is great. And unless you're gifted with the greatest supervisor in the world who puts you onto the instant path to success, it's likely that whatever you might want to publish as a student has already been done previously and maybe better by a more experienced researcher. Journals are, in the end, inundated with papers from students who are submitting as part of a graduation requirement and not a genuine need to be published. And in the end, these papers, which are again replete with the errors of developing scientists, going to get published. The only question is where. The worst papers will trickle down to the worst journals, and yes, those exist, and likely are going to have the most accepting, least rigorous of reviewers. They might go into conference proceedings, which also might have lower standards than the average journal. This is not always the case, but in many cases it is like that. For journals that try to have a good For journals that try to have a good editorial process, they're saddled with papers that ultimately are more than they can handle because there's always going to be more authors than reviewers. There are going to be more students than lecturers. The knock-on effect of publish or perish and an academia driven by metrics is that there will always be editors and reviewers who are spread thin. Editors will be given less time to look at individual submissions, meaning that they're not going to give it the attention that it might require, and groundbreaking research might go by the wayside. Or reviewers who are burdened with portioning a limited amount of their time on a paper are going to be less rigorous in looking at it. This might depend on the country or the journal, but many or most reviewers are providing free labor. 
they're volunteering their free time and this does mean that we cannot really expect more than just that volunteer time no matter how many meticulous hours you have poured into your research the slog of writing all about it and the entire mental effort that it takes to submit the whole damn thing we are still beholden to a reviewer who's providing volunteered time and we might not be able to expect the luxury of them going over every data point finding every error and writing down every single way in which we can improve it reviewers who will dedicate a good portion of their free time to editing a paper thoroughly do certainly exist that might be many or most but so do exist a subset of reviewers who will simply quickly scan a paper and provide a few bullet points and sure these bullet points might help to improve the paper but that might still not be what is actually enough to improve it enough to make it worth publishing and if output is commensurate with input a sloppy review might result in a sloppy paper in a journal that is perhaps publishing many sloppy papers finally we have conflicting reviews and these are normal and do happen occasionally their existence doesn't invalidate the entire peer review process but they do highlight its fraughtness ideally in such a situation a subsequent reviewer is enlisted and whichever side the reviewer comes on you can make an appropriate decision but there will always be the minority review an editor must have good judgment and that might not always be the case they have to know when a review has not been thorough enough perhaps or maybe even has come to the incorrect conclusion because the reviewer has not been putting in the required effort it comes down to trust and faith in the editorial process of the journal again we can trust that the journal knows how to handle conflicting reviews and that the editor knows how to come to the appropriate conclusions based on the conflicting reviews taking all of them into account but we cannot know for sure and every editor might not be the most experienced and able to handle it in the most appropriate way again it is about faith and trust in peer review this returns us to the common trope of peer review full of problems but the least worst system that we have is that really the case there are alternative approaches and solutions to peer review that suggest no traditional peer review as we know it is not the best system available actually like all systems and science itself peer review must continue to evolve and adapt to the problems of the time the first alternative I'd like to highlight is open peer review there is no fixed definition of open peer review but we can consider it as peer review but more transparent and more accountable in terms of the reviewers this approach has already been used by a number of journals for example plus and bmj and nature communications and we can consider it to have one or more of these core components the first is that it's not blind this means that both authors and reviewers know each other's identities and the readers also know the identities of the reviewers the second is that the content of the review is published alongside the paper the third is that the paper is published on a network based platform for example a forum and direct participation of the wider scientific community is enabled through this forum this does mean that open peer review can include post publication peer review meaning that the article the paper the research is reviewed after the fact the fourth component is decoupled peer review wherein the review process is separated from the publisher 
year, an author has their paper pre-reviewed through an independent service and then will submit their reviewed paper to a journal or, interestingly, the journal might approach them through the surface or another way and then offer the author to have their paper published with them. And the fifth is that the paper might be uploaded to a preprint server for open commentary from other scientists ahead of its submission to a journal. Of its pros and cons, open peer review might be faster than traditional peer review and more efficient, and the greater transparency from it might actually encourage more constructive and thorough reviews. It should also be easier to identify potential conflicts of interest through open peer review, and reviewers will actually get credit for the reviews that they provide to journals. On the other hand, there is a reason for anonymity with peer review, and it's to protect reviewers from potentially disgruntled authors. And some research has also shown that the feedback from reviewers through open peer review is actually less critical because reviewers might be unwilling to provide too, let's just say, critical or too negative feedback to authors if their identity is going to be exposed. As the toads croak again, a second alternative is, well, to abolish pre-publication peer review altogether. And this is what Remco Heeson and Liam Coffey Bright suggest. They propose as a remedy to the time and effort taken during traditional peer review that authors will instead publish their paper on a preprint server or something like that and then publish updated versions of their papers in response to the comments and questions from their peers. And the function in this proposal of a journal is that instead it will serve as a curation of articles. They will collect and publish curated versions of the articles that they find on these preprint servers. One interesting aspect of their proposal is infrastructural. For example, if peer review is largely incapable of detecting fraud, whether because reviewers are inequipped to do that or simply don't want to accuse a, an author of, of misconduct, then abolishing traditional peer review will actually encourage external infrastructural steps to address this issue, which under traditional peer review might not actually be getting the attention that it needs. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching. This video was co-written with my wife, Laylee, and if you have any comments or feedback, we'd love to hear them. I'm going to put my rabbit down now so that she can continue eating all of my shrubbery.